Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to begin our program, and uh, I'll repeat briefly what I said upstairs, that uh, when I was uh, fortunate enough to be invited to participate in the uh, Academic Advisory Council of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, uh, I never... Uh, dream that I would have an opportunity to become familiar with uh, so many uh, distinguished uh, scholars and personalities, uh, and uh, that includes uh, our speaker this evening, including, of course, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who, as you know, is also on the Academic Advisory Council and has been to our community uh, at some point during the bicentennial celebrations. Uh, Harold Holzer, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is uh, not just on the Academic Advisory Council, though he could, by virtue of his attainments and accomplishments, he could uh, be the chair of that. Uh, he is the co-chair of the entire uh, Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. But for anyone who knows anything about Abraham Lincoln, then the name of Harold Holzer is uh, certainly... Uh, a well known to folks in this uh, in, in that circle of readers because uh, Holzer is by all accounts uh, one of the leading authorities on the sixteenth president i 've had an opportunity to get to know him personally we were We actually did a uh, program a co lecture if you will in Miami. I got to meet his wife I got to meet his mother <laughs> Harold, how is mom? She, she, she's doing, she's coming home for Pesach soon. Okay. It, will you give her my greetings? I will, but then I'll, now you're making me tell the story, and I will. Okay. When we All start. Right. Okay. So I'm going to now give a formal introduction because a scholar from New York City merits that. And uh, so Harold Holzer is the Senior Vice President for External Affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He serves, as I said, as the co-chair of the United States Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. He was appointed to that post by President Bill Clinton. He is the author, the co-author, or editor of 35 books on Lincoln and the Civil War era. And among these are the Lincoln image, the Confederate image, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln as I knew him, Dear Mr. Lincoln, Letters to the President, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, and many, many more wonderful books. What I really appreciate about Harold, uh, though he's not, I'm not saying he's the only scholar of such, but he has play, made a, a tremendous effort to focus on documents and documentary analysis, which has uh, distinguished his scholarship. Uh, 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 his latest books, which uh, I confess I myself have not yet gotten to read, but Harold people who have have had nothing but great praise, and uh, that's uh, Lincoln, the President-elect, Abraham Lincoln, and the Great Secession Winter, uh, 1860 to 1861. That book, which was published in 2008, won for Harold Holzer the Berendus Lincoln Award and the Award of Achievement of the Lincoln Group of New York. He also published last year the Lincoln Anthology, and that is a Library of America collection featuring 150 years of great writers on the subject of Abraham Lincoln. And last year, he also published In Lincoln's Hand, featuring Lincoln's original manuscripts with commentary by distinguished Americans. And also last year, that's why I said upstairs, he writes faster than I can read. Uh, Lincoln and New York, which was published last year, which is a catalog of the New York Hist uh, uh, Historical Society exhibition on Lincoln, and he was the chief historian for that exhibition. He's written more than 400 articles over the past 35 years in both scholarly and popular publications. He's won many awards for writing, and most recently, the National Endowment Medal, which he received from President uh, George Bush in 2008. He's a former journalist, a political and government press secretary. He served, interestingly enough, for Bella Abzug and Mario Cuomo. Uh, he knows quite a bit about our subject because he's also written a very fine monograph 
on Abraham Lincoln and the Jews, which uh, I have uh, depended upon and cited in the work that I'm now developing on uh, Lincoln and the Jews, which uh, you all know about. So it is a real honor and a privilege to uh, bring to Cincinnati uh, this distinguished scholar and leader in this field. Uh, will you welcome warmly uh, Mr. Harold Holzer. Thank you, Gary. I, I trust everyone can hear me. It's a little hard to know in this, uh, of the arrangement that we have here, but I know someone will come back and uh, raise their hand. Now I can see you. That's much better if, uh, if there's a problem. I promised originally that I wouldn't tell a joke, but Gary has inspired me by asking about my mom, who is um, 94 years old. Uh, was about 92 when we did our event in Miami Beach, and uh, Gary and I did an event together, as he said, and my mother was there, and a lot of the girls, as she calls them, from the condominium, who were all 85 to 95, and after the event, she was very pleased, very happy that I was praised and all of that. She was quelling, as they say, and then um, I said, Mom, I made the mistake. You all know you never do this. Mom, how did you like the event? She said, well, it was very good, she said, except the rabbi, she said. I said, what's wrong with the rabbi? She said, well, he's not Jewish. I said, what do you mean? He's... I said, Mom, he's, he, of course he's Jewish. He's a rabbi. He's a very well-known rabbi, very important rabbi. She said, no, he's not Jewish. I said, Mom, what makes you think he's not Jewish? She said, the hair. <laughs> so I promised I wouldn't do a redhead joke, but she still, does, she still doesn't believe that he's really a rabbi. But um, uh, it was a great event, and it was uh, an overflow crowd in Miami at the Historical Society, which interestingly is the first synagogue ever built in Miami Beach. Um, and when it was built, there were no Jews in Miami Beach, which is, you know, sort of runs against the grain of what you think is the cliche about that area of Florida. But it was totally restricted. And I think the synagogue went up and, you know, around the turn of the century, maybe a little later. It's a wonderful place. We had an overflow crowd and touched on this subject that, as Gary said, he's developing uh, into a book, I hope, that comes out soon. I'm going to talk a little bit about my take on Lincoln and the Jews uh, tonight. And it's a perfect time to do it, perfect time of year, because... When he died, Abraham Lincoln was generally viewed in the Jewish community as sort of an American Moses, someone who had taken people out of slavery uh, to the promised land, not quite getting to see the promised land himself. And uh, as I will discuss at the end of this little talk, which will, uh, will be an abridged version of what I usually do on this subject so we have a chance to dialogue here across the continent, but what made that image more powerful uh, and more evocative was the fact that Lincoln died um, on, at a time when, just like this year, almost like this year, uh, um, Easter and Pesach were at the same time. So while most historians talk about the fact that Easter Sunday service, Lincoln was killed on Good Friday, a shot on Good Friday, died on Saturday, uh, that Easter Sunday services that year were called Black Easter in the United States and devoted to, to, uh, to Lincoln's memory as a second Jesus, almost, who had died for the nation's sins. But it was also Yontif. It was the end of Passover. So Lincoln was celebrated in shuls throughout the large cities of the North, an interesting development that, that is seldom discussed. But let's get to know Lincoln and his relationship with the Jewish community. Um, he did know Jewish people um, in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. Um, it was a period of, let's face it, rampant anti-Semitism, not only unofficial but almost institutionalized anti-Semitism in the United States Army, for example. Uh, General Sherman, who's viewed as a hero in most Civil War books, once warned darkly that with the onset of the war, the country will soon be swarming, he said, with dishonest Jews. Grant famously took steps to expel Jews from his military department. Here is a, a quote from uh, a Confederate diarist in 1861 at the beginning of the war. 
And there were a lot of Jews in the South, and a Jew rose to the position of Secretary of State in the Confederate government. So actually a little easier institutionally in the South. But this quote comes right at the beginning of the war. The Jews are at work. Having no nationality, all wars are harvests for them. It has been so from the day of the dispersion. Now they're scouring the country in all directions, buying all the goods they can find. These they will keep until the prices rise, and then they'll raise a greedy demand for all descriptions of merchandise. That's the atmosphere we have to realize existed north as well as south in the Civil War. In that atmosphere, Lincoln understood Jews because he knew some. Um, he knew a man named Abraham Jonas, uh, one of 22 children born in England, a one-time auctioneer and shop owner who moved to Lincoln's part of Illinois and became a valuable supporter, a member of the New Republican Party, a man whom Lincoln would later refer to as one of his most valuable political friends. He later appointed him a postmaster in Illinois, a job he held until his death when Lincoln quietly transferred the job to his wife uh, at a time when he was reluctant to reward his own female relatives with patronage appointments. He even patrol, uh, paroled Jonas's own son, who was a Confederate prisoner of war, to visit his dying father on his deathbed. So in that case, the sins of the, fa of the son were not visited on the father. He knew a man named Julius Hammersloff, one of his hometown merchants in Springfield, who attended his inauguration and later helped raise funds to build his tomb. Photographer Samuel Altshuler, whose descendant Gary Zola and I met in Florida, uh, took his picture in 1858 and felt so sorry for the way he was dressed that he lent him his beautiful velvet-trimmed coat to pose. Two years later, Altshuler turned out to be the photographer in Chicago who took the very first photograph of Abraham Lincoln with whiskers. He was beginning to grow in the days leading up to his inauguration. There was the Bavarian-born Chicago merchant named Abraham Cohn, president of the congregation on Shemariv, another staunch Republican. Just before Lincoln left Illinois for his inaugural, Cohn, K-O-H-N, by the way, sent him a flag emblazoned with Hebrew writing from Deuteronomy. It said, translating, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither thou be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. I think someone translated it for Lincoln, maybe Cohn himself, because a few days later, Spring Lincoln left Springfield and gave a speech that I think was clearly inspired by Deuteronomy, inspired by those words. He declared his trust in a God who could go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good. Almost an Old Testament inspiration directly from, from a Jewish friend. Now, one of the most famous and celebrated of Lincoln's Jewish acquaintances was his Jewish doctor. Sounds like a cliche, but it's a very interesting story. His, na his name was Issachar Zachary. He was a chiropodist. Um, a New York newspaper described him as having a splendid Roman nose, fashionable whiskers, an eloquent tongue, a, a dazzling diamond breast pin, and great skill in his profession. Um, in 1862, Lincoln heard that Zachary could boast among his famous patients, um, Henry Clay. I like to say that having heard that Zachary treated feet of clay, he was ready for Zachary because Lincoln's hero was, Zachary, was Henry Clay. And when he heard that he'd been one of Zachary's patients, he sent for him. Um, he had terrible problems with his feet, mainly because they were enormous and it was very hard for him to get either commercially made or even custom made boots that would not pain him. Well, the press found out about this visit and naturally they had a field day. Uh, one newspaper joked, it would seem that all of our past troubles have originated not so much with the head of the government, 
but with the feet of the government. And Dr. Zachary has now shown us exactly where the shoe pinches. And he worked wonders with Lincoln. Lincoln actually wrote an endorsement for Zachary that he could take and trade off and get other patients. It said, Dr. Zachary has operated on my feet with great success and considerable attention to my comfort. Zachary fitted Lincoln for made-to-order boots. He walked without pain. But it's important to know, and it's a reminder of the fact that not all Jews were popular or accepted in the America of the 1860s, that there were military people to whom Zachary next went for, for customers who were not impressed and were not free from prejudices. One assessed Zachary as the lowest and vulgarest form of Jew peddler, saying it is enough to condemn Mr. Lincoln that he can make a friend of such an odious creature. But Lincoln was not swayed by that kind of prejudice and bigotry. He began using Zachary not only as a doctor, but as an emissary to Jewish communities. Um, they must have had very interesting discussions during their medical sessions. Lincoln knew that the port of New Orleans, which had a large Jewish population, Zachary went off to New Orleans. Remember, we were talking about the doctor who became a political emissary. Lincoln sent him to Richmond on, 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 um, to open up that community um, to, to test Jewish loyalty to the Union in these areas. Um, he worked hard for Lincoln's reelection in 1864. He wrote, uh, Zachary wrote a letter, a famous letter to Lincoln saying, the Israelites with but few exceptions will vote for you. I understand them well. I've secured good and trustworthy men to attend to them on election day. By the way, speaking as an old political operative, you know what you call the idea of getting people to come out and vote? You call it foot pulling. So I don't know if they called it that then, but who better to do foot pulling than a chiropodist after all? But Lincoln was a good judge of character. He was a master of using people who could be useful. He was eager to find emissaries to new communities, especially as the war was winding down and um, um, Lincoln was seeking to find loyal people in the conquered uh, Confederate states. So I think Zachary was a useful figure for him. But Zachary's efforts in the 1864 campaign created a stir among who else? Fellow Jews. There is no Jewish vote, the editor of the Jewish Messenger wrote, and if there were, it could not be bought. It actually became something of a mini scandal in the campaign. Lincoln had to have an aide write a letter to these leaders and these editors assuring them that no one had ever pledged the Jewish vote to him. No one thought there was a uh, homogeneous Jewish vote that could be bought or ordered about. Um, so that's the Isaac or Zachary story. Now, I guess in a way, if you remember the other stories I told you about his Illinois friends and the Dr. Zachary story, they all fit into the, you know, a category you could call some of my best friends are Jewish. They're interesting, but they don't really serve any um, political test of Lincoln as the non-bigoted man, the enlightened man of the 19th century. But I can give you two examples of Lincoln confronting real tests and passing them, where his relationship to the Jewish community was concerned. Um, he passed both of them with honors, and I'll be interested in hearing during the Q&A whether you agree. A year into the war, there was still not one Jewish chaplain in the armed services, because federal law still required that chaplains be ordained Christian ministers any Christian denomination, but Christian. And of course, Jews wanted their own chaplains. They had a champion in um, a congressman from your state, Ohio, Clement Laird Vallandigham, who took to the House floor to demand that Jews get equal chaplaincy rights. Unfortunately, Jews could not have had a more counterproductive advocate than Vallandigham. He was an anti-war Democrat who would later actually be arrested for treason and sentenced to expulsion into the South. He actually went to Canada and ran for governor of Ohio while he was in Canada in 1864. He didn't win, but he was considered disloyal by many people. So having Volandigam be the advocate for Jews 
in chaplaincy was the reverse of what was going to be useful. Um, but then there was something called the Allen Incident. Michael Allen was a rabbinical student, elected chaplain of a largely Jewish regiment headed by a colonel named Max Friedman. Allen began holding non-sectarian services on Sunday, Sundays because that's the day that soldiers were allowed to worship. But when the army found out, it pressured him into quitting because the argument was, you're not really ordained yet, you can't lead services. So Friedman, Colonel Friedman, then appointed a fully ordained New York rabbi named Arnold Fischel to take his place. So the Sanitary Commission, the private organization that was dedicated to administering to the social and religious and health needs of the soldiers, ordered that Fischel couldn't be a, be a minister to the faith either because the law required all chaplains to be Christians. So Jewish leaders went public. They wrote editorials in Jewish periodicals, and they ultimately sent a delegation to the White House, where Fischel begged Lincoln to recognize, as he put it, the principle of religious liberty, the constitutional rights of the Jewish community, and the welfare of Jewish volunteers, who faced battle, who faced injury, without spiritual support. Lincoln was convinced, and he pledged, I shall try to have a new law broad enough to cover what is desired by you in behalf of the Israelites, as he put it. That summer, the law was duly amended to include all regularly ordained ministers of some denomination. The word Christian was expunged from the statute. That September, Lincoln named Rabbi Joseph Frankel of Philadelphia as the first Jewish chaplain in the American military in its history. Under Lincoln... Jews reversed four score years of institutionalized discrimination within the army. That's quite an achievement, I think. A graver test, though, was yet to come. The result of an action, ironically, by one of the great heroes of the war, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant had won a crucial Union victory at the Battle of Shiloh, Tennessee, in 1862, and Lincoln understandably came to regard him as indispensable. But Grant kept hallucinating about Jews infiltrating his encampments en masse, speculating and profiteering from his poor victim soldiers. So in July 1862, he ordered his commanders to inspect all visitors' baggage and in a coda to his order, added some very nasty Jewish profiling. Jews should receive special attention. That November... He told another officer, the Israelites should be kept out. They are such an intolerable nuisance that the, the department must be purged of them. Weeks later, he was railing about the total disregard and evasion of orders of the Jews, saying, my policy is to exclude them as far as practicable. Then, Grant's own father turned up in camp, hand in hand with some Jewish cotton brokers, eager for a profit although no greedier for a prophet than the elder Mr. Grant. Perhaps believing his father had been duped, the general let his hostility run wild. On December 17, 1862, he issued his infamous General Order No. 11, which read in part, the Jews as a class, violating every regulation of trade, are hereby expelled from the department within 24 hours. All of this class of people are required to leave, and anyone returning after such notification will be arrested and held in confinement. Hard to believe. Soon thereafter, the Jewish residents of Paducah were expelled too. It was a pogrom in the making, and it prompted a protest to Lincoln against the outrageous treatment of Jewish families of this town, wrote the citizens of Paducah, as outlaws before the whole world. Rabbis unleashed a firestorm of criticism from the pulpit and from the press. Now, the commander-in-chief might have ignored all of this outcry because he couldn't afford to humiliate his most valuable military asset. Lincoln didn't have any Jewish... <laughs> Lincoln didn't have any generals who were winning battles. Grant had to be nurtured. He had to be coddled. But... Lincoln would not excuse or cover up. 
he came to the rescue. When a delegation led by Caesar Caskell visited him in the White House to lodge a formal protest, Lincoln supposedly said in his usual jocular way, so the children of Israel were forced out of the happy land of Canaan, to which a delegate shot back, yes, and that is why we have come to Father Abraham asking protection. And Lincoln assured him that protection you shall have. Isaac Wise soon came, the founder of the institution I'm sitting in tonight, and Lincoln told Rabbi Wise and his delegation, I don't like to see a class or a nationality condemned on account of a few sinners. As Wise remembered, the president convinced us that he knew of no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, and he feels none against any nationality, especially against Israelites. So in one of the few occasions where he ever overruled his prize general, Lincoln made sure that Order Number 11 was, in fact, rescinded. He didn't mind expelling peddlers, Lincoln explained privately, but Grant had proscribed a whole class, some of whom are fighting in our ranks. By the way, Lincoln didn't do it, didn't order Grant directly. He had another general, General in Chief Halleck, do the ordering, sort of to insulate Grant from any embarrassment from the president. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, in part one of our uh, interrupted melody here, Lincoln was killed on Good Friday. That was also Passover. Sabbath services, Yontif services were devoted to the grief that sorrowed the hearts of the people, according to one banner over a synagogue. Rabbis took an active part in Lincoln's funeral in New York. 3,000 Jews marched in the New York funeral procession. In a city draped in black, a young shopkeeper named Abraham Abraham was so moved that he bought a bust of Lincoln, draped it in black, and displayed it in his window. He later found a partner named Mr. Strauss, and the store became the very famous Abraham and Strauss, which I hope some of you have heard of. It, I don't think it exists in New York anymore, but it was pretty famous when I was growing up. In Chicago, a special canopy was provided by the city's Jews, inscribed with a Hebrew lament, the beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. Rabbi Wise, who earlier had called Lincoln a primitive, he was not a Republican, now praised the spirit and principle of the man and predicted he would live forever in both history and heaven. In St. Louis, a rabbi named Henry Vedaver quoted the welcoming cry of Elijah when he saw God carrying his master to heaven. O oh, my father, my father, thou chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. These great sermons exist in the literature, many in German, which I don't read, but Gary Zola probably reads it. So when he does his great treatment, I'm sure he's going to get through all of this material and tell us what the rabbis around the country said in these sermons that were published uh, right after 1865. At Congregation Shiarath Israel, the Mourners Kaddish was recited for the first time for a non-Jew, inspiring a protest from some members of the Orthodox tradition, but mostly praise. If Lincoln could remove racist barriers and open up the army to Jewish chaplains, then the synagogues could say Kaddish for their Gentile champion. Speaking at the largest synagogue in once Confederate New Orleans, a Jewish chaplain preached, we as Jews had a distinct ground to love, respect, and esteem him. His mind was not subject to the vulgar clamor against Jews. Philadelphia rabbi said he recognized our claims to national protection, so strong and noble a contrast to others that we should be guilty of gross ingratitude not to acknowledge it. And most Jews did. They acknowledge a special bond with Lincoln, sorrow at his loss. Um, mainly, I guess, attributable to Lincoln's acts of compassion and justice. And, and I think perhaps also, and we haven't touched on this, to the fact that Lincoln's own religion seemed so nonspecific, so universal. Um, Lincoln was sort of a deist. He seldom mentioned, he mentioned the father in many of his speeches, but he never mentioned the son. He never mentioned the Holy Ghost. He talked about all people's religion, uh, saying my religion is 
I feel good when I do good, and everyone should do good because they'll feel good. You know, sort of um, every man is his brother's keeper kind of religion. Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, during the bicentennial, and, and Gary may know this story, one of those Internet rumors that sometimes sort of sweeps the World Wide Web began circulating. It was called an unreal exclusive like Jesus and Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud and Neil Diamond, I love that group, by the way, and countless other people who changed the world, in case you didn't know that Neil Diamond changed the world, Abraham Lincoln was a Jew. This is on the World Wide Web. What was the evidence? He never pledged allegiance to a church. His grandfather's name was Mordecai. And Lincoln, England, the town where his ancestors came from, had once expelled the Jews. And this is the way the story concluded. It's quite exciting to learn that we had a Jewish president, especially since he wasn't Joe Lieberman. <laughs> and then, and then this, this internet web rumor ended, Abraham Lincoln, oi the nachas. <laughs> but I can't tell you how many people took this seriously. I had hundreds of emails from people who said, did you know this? What is your response? Tongue-in-cheek, I guess. But again, uh, people were acting like they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it's a high-tech manifestation of what I think Gary Zola has um, pointed to as a phenomenon of remarkable endurance, seeking a common identity with Lincoln in an effort to balance Americanism and Jewishness in a new world. Um, Gary cites Genesis to illuminate American Jews' long-standing sense that Lincoln was like one of us. As I said, Lincoln once summed up his faith this way. When I do good, I feel good, and when I do bad, I feel bad, and that's my religion. And perhaps it's no accident that the sentiment is remarkably close to what Hillel urged in his teachings. What is hateful to thee, do not do unto my fellow. It did not hurt a man of such all-embracing faith and tolerance that the Sermon on the Mount had included a proactive turn on this phrase, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That simple but poignant philosophy made Lincoln seem to Jews in his own day like God's child and America's father at one at the same time. And when Lincoln died, many Jews really did feel that the beauty of Israel was slain upon the high places. Remember Passover, you can understand this phrase printed by the New York Times. It is as when there, there was a great cry in Egypt, where there was not a house, where there was not one dead. A reference, of course, to one of the plagues. And as Rabbi Samuel Adler put it at Temple Emmanuel here in New York, after Lincoln's death and at one of those Kaddish services for the slain president. Abraham Lincoln has not fallen. He is lost to us, but as light, he remains to us in memory and adoration and will so remain forever. And I think that that rabbi was right. History has vindicated that prediction. Thank you very much. Now, the bad news is that I didn't hear you applaud, so that may mean that the sound is off. Did you applaud or were you just going through the motions? Okay. We're going to have a tough time again, I think. We need audio. If you have questions, is, is Gary, Gary, are you going to lead questions now? All right. Can, can you hear me all right now? Now I can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay. So this, this may not. All right. <laughs> you were a big hit. You were a big hit here in Cincinnati, which is a lot tougher a crowd than the evil empire of New York. And uh, and uh, uh, but but uh, uh, people did say they, they they is there something wrong with the color? Uh, because we thought uh, uh, Mr. Holzer had reddish hair, and I guess he doesn't. So. But uh, this used to be red, if it's any consolation. It to is. You. It is. That's why right. we like each other. Uh, okay. I, I'll, I'll try to field some of the questions. Uh, uh, is he able to see the audience now? I see you now, but I oh, did right. see that. In a, minute, in a minute, we'll shift to the audience in a minute. Okay, 
Okay, you guys see them now. Okay, so I'll ask the first question, and then this will give you a few, uh, you know, a few minutes to think of any questions you'd like to ask. Okay, so uh, the first question that I I wanted to ask uh, is is this? Um, it's not as well known, but uh, as you know, it's very remarkable how many of those who've preserved Lincoln's memory over the years, I'm talking about historians and collectors, you represent that group in our own day uh, so excellently. Would you mind offering your thoughts uh, as to why it is that uh, of uh, our small population, so many uh, who have collected Lincolnalia, who've written books, who wanted to make sure that these details, some of which you cited, uh, uh, lived on and were preserved. What, what do you think is behind all of that? Well, it's, a very, uh, it's actually a very good point. I hadn't thought much about it. Um, there are scholars, um, collectors like uh, Ralph Newman of Chicago, Louise Taper of uh, Los Angeles, and writers... Uh, maybe a bit disproportionate to our presence in the population, but I think it's this sense that alone among American leaders, Lincoln had this fatherly protection and not a deep commitment to Christian principles, to doctrinaire Christian principles that seemed exclusionary. This sense that Lincoln was a deist who believed in God, but not necessarily in the Trinity, was fairly well known in its time because Lincoln was famously or infamously not a church member, although he did go to church. Um, he was criticized for it, um, for not being a church member uh, in his earlier campaigns for office. There's also something about the immigrant experience and the learning curve that immigrants and the children of immigrants, uh, I'm the grandchildren, <laughs> grandchild of immigrants, what they are taught in the schools. And one of the first things they're taught about is Abraham Lincoln with his kindly face, with his beard. And I think that there's an interesting connectivity that arises from Lincoln and his graciousness and his compassion, his forgiveness, his nature as a forgiver. It's almost like he's the Kol Nidre president. He pardons people. He, he forgives people. Um, Salahti, right? That's the, the, the correct phrase for that time of year. Um, there's a great story, which maybe Gary is prompting me to tell, if I'm answering this in a in an understandable way, um, I just have to think of his name, Judge. Oh, Judge Abraham Lincoln Maravitz of Chicago, Illinois. He was a federal judge. He was a real character, a very famous banquet speaker in Chicago. He lived to be about 98. He was an active federal jurist until his mid 90s, and he used to tell a story that why he was named Abraham Lincoln Maravitz by his Polish mother who came from the shtetl and arrived here and and she said because Abraham Lincoln was such a good Jew that's why I named little Abela Abraham Lincoln Maravitz what do you mean well because we know that he was shot in the temple it's a true story that's the story his mother believed that his wound indicated that he was at a synagogue I think Judge Maravitz got a bigger laugh than I just got when he told the story, but that must be because he was such a famous after-dinner speaker. Empathy. It's transcendent, and it still exists. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. So are there any questions? Uh, if you would like to do so, we'll be able to ask uh, now. Are there any? We have one question over here. Okay, now you, you go ahead and just press that button. Go right ahead. Press and hold. Press and hold. Yes. I'd like to ask you, who do you think are the five greatest presidents and maybe why? Uh, okay. Well, you know, I actually do this every year for uh, C-SPAN. C-SPAN does a historian's poll, which I'm uh, lucky enough to participate in. Um, Lincoln first, because of the reasons that are obvious, uh, preserving the Union and cleansing it of its one great hypocrisy, American slavery. And saving the Union meant validating the whole idea of democracy. Uh, Washington for creating the Union in the first place and for uh, 
stabilizing the American presidency and by uh, refusing to accept uh, the status of royalty when he became president. Um, Roosevelt, for all of the perceptions uh, about him um, and his indifference and insensitivity to the Holocaust, because if he hadn't won the war, if he hadn't persevered, the Holocaust would have been global. And I think he understood that that his his uh, his main goal after 1940 was to win the war. And because he's the only president who solved two global crises, the Depression and World War II. Two personal choices. Claim, I mean, we can go on with Jefferson and others. Not Wilson, um, but Kennedy, because he inspired me when I was 11 years old. Um, he didn't have time to accomplish what his promise was, but I wore a Kennedy button to fifth and sixth grade, wherever I was. I think it was sixth grade. Uh, I was absolutely captivated by him and by his rhetoric. Um, I pretended to be sick on the day of his inauguration so I could watch every minute of it on on a little black and white television, and um, Bill Clinton, because I just love him. Uh, any other questions while we have uh, the privilege of being okay? Uh, I'll, I'll first, uh, student rabbi Ari Plost, you go right ahead, hit the button. I was, uh, I was wondering, um, and I find it absolutely amazing that uh, an African-American uh, also from uh, Lincoln's home state, is now occupying uh, the White House, and that he also is a fellow member of the Illinois Bar. And I'm wondering to what degree do you think that Lincoln's background as an advocate uh, may have influenced in some ways his orientation or his feelings towards the people of the law? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about Obama. Um, well, I think I, w I will answer about Obama anyway because I have this wonderful answer. So, but I'll answer your question. I think Lincoln's um, familiarity with with the law, and he was an awfully good, you know, autodidact of a lawyer. He taught himself the law. I think it inflected his rhetoric, and by by inspiring him to be not. Uh, purple in his prose, but to be very logical, uh, to be very fact-driven, even with eloquence added. I think he, in a sense, revolutionized American political discourse, because until Lincoln, uh, stemwinders with great rhetorical, biblical, and classical allusions were the norm. Two and a half hour stemwinders were the norm, and while Lincoln did offer his share of three hour speeches in his day, famously in New York, uh, at Cooper Union in 1860, he sharpened the tone. It was all about research. It was all about logic. It was all about one layer of, of information following another. It was almost as if his speeches were pleas to juries, which was the most uh, powerful part of his arsenal as a lawyer, as opposed to research and um, um, precedent. And let me just say one word about Obama. Um, President Obama is a very serious Lincoln student, as, by the way, it's very interesting. Um, the last four presidents, all of whom I've had the privilege to, uh, to converse with about Abraham Lincoln, are not, you know, what is the expression, fly-by-night Lincoln students. They are serious enthusiasts. They were serious readers. President Bush read lots of books about Abraham Lincoln, knew lots of things about Abraham Lincoln. Clinton, it goes without saying, read everything about Lincoln, because I think he reads a book a day. Um, um, Obama has read an amazing amount about Abraham Lincoln, and all you have to do is look at the at the uh, the trajectory of his campaign to see the connection that he feels as a lawyer, as an Illinoisan, uh, as an there's Ari back there, as an African American, to um, to Abraham Lincoln. Um, he announced his campaign at the Springfield State House where Lincoln gave his house divided address. He did the inaugural journey in part. He dedicated his inauguration to, to Abraham Lincoln. He called it the New Birth of Freedom inauguration. And he famously took his oath uh, 
on the Bible that Abraham Lincoln used to take his oath. But I think I'll just add one coda to this. I think the press got it wrong when they said he took the oath on Lincoln's Bible because it wasn't Lincoln's Bible. It's an even better story than that if you look deeper about the, um, uh, the provenance of this, of this small Bible. It was actually brought up um, at the last minute for the swearing-in ceremony because Lincoln's Bible was packed in his belongings that were uh, in, still in crates on their way to the White House that morning. This Bible belonged to the Supreme Court. This Bible belonged to Roger Tawney, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who in his infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857 held that African Americans could never be citizens of the United States. There's the great irony of that Bible. That's the Bible that the first African American president used to swear the oath of office. Uh, Harold, that's something no one here in this room knew. Boy, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. We're, we'll take uh, any other questions. We'll take one more. Are there any others? It looks like we have one more. That's it? Going, going, gone? Okay, last question for the evening, and then we'll say thank you. Could you comment on the changes or why U.S. Grant changed from the expulsion order to having good relations with Jews during his presidency? Uh, and you're absolutely, it's a very good question. You're absolutely right. He, he did have very good relations with the Jewish community in Washington. In fact, um, he did his penance for his order number 11 because um, the, the Jewish Historical Society, which now occupies the Orthodox synagogue that existed during Grant's presidency, invited him to a Shabbat service on a Friday night. And Ulysses S. Grant sat there in a wooden pew. I've sat in it. Maybe Gary has too. It's not comfortable. And he sat there with his hot hat on for three hours. And that's what I call apology. Um, for an all Hebrew or maybe Yiddish, Hebrew and German, Hebrew and Yiddish service. Um, why? One explanation is that Grant just got his nomenclature wrong. He meant Jewish peddlers. He didn't want people selling at high profits to his army. And this um, was rife in the army in the 1860s. People would go in and sell at high prices and make high profits and rip off soldiers who desperately needed the kind of little things that they weren't getting, you know, in regular supply. Everything, frankly, from toilet tissues to newspapers to pens and inks to write letters home. That's what these guys trafficked in. Um, some were Jews. Why were they peddlers? Because that's what they were in the first generation. They were peddlers. Maybe Grant just got it after a while. Um, he had a very smart political um, uh, ally in um, an Illinois congressman who was his um, uh, who, who introduced him to Washington, Congressman Washburn. And I think he just sort of met Jewish people finally and liked them. The, the answer is, if you're so remote from people and you don't know them, then you don't get it. Um, Abraham Lincoln is criticized by many in the African-American community today for caring more about slavery than he cared about African-Americans. And that may be, I always explain, because the only African-Americans he knew until he became president were the guy who took care of his horse, the guy who cut his hair. He didn't have any exposure to people like Frederick Douglass or Sojourner Truth until he became president and realized that there were African-Americans who were, in fact, his equals and to whom he treated as equals. I think the same thing is true of Grant. But he did, to his credit, go out of the way to have exemplary um, relations with the Jewish community in Washington. And um, as I say, the tradition is to forgive, so we forgave. Harold, uh, we're getting feedback? Not necessarily. Okay. I uh, wanted to stand here in order to thank you uh, personally. Uh, it, one, one thing as remarkable as this technology is, and it is a great blessing that we're able to bring you to Cincinnati and, and, and not have you too far from your home, uh, I'm not always sure that it communicates uh, to the speaker uh, how much appreciation uh, and joy that is uh, on this side of the screen.
So I, uh, be, on behalf of all of us here in Cincinnati, I want to thank you very much for being with us this evening. And I know that uh, the audience is going to thank you now for uh, really what was a very wonderful, inspiring, and informative talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.